Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus. I'm Trace. This is the fifth episode of our space travel series. If you aren't familiar with the show and this is your first time, make sure you subscribe and check out all of our episodes in this series. But today we're talking about if there is a better way to do space travel. We've already talked about astronaut training. We've talked about the spacecraft themselves and the history of rocketry and even how tough it is to live in space. But what about for the future? Where are we going to go? What's next in space travel? That's where we're going now. Right now, we get to space in what's called a chemical rocket. That's what they refer to them in, in a more official capacity. It's, it, think about the shuttle, for example. Chemical rocket means that it's using a chemical, burning a chemical to get there. I mean, ideally, we could use something like a space elevator, which is literally like a regular elevator in a building, but it goes to space. But nobody's been able to invent anything like that yet. So right now, we're using chemical rockets. If you think of the space shuttle, you get that big orange tank that's attached to the bottom of the shuttle, standing upright. That's filled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and it is not reusable. They build a new one every time that they launch a rocket. They've launched 135 times. Then they have two sticks that attach to the side, those white rockets that look very much like missiles. They contain solid fuel. The solid fuel inside of the rocket boosters on the side, which are called SRBs, or solid rocket boosters, is a solid fuel, and it's in an 11-point star formation, which is kind of neat. It's baked that way, and then they put it in there so that they can have the most surface area exposed for the burn. So they attach all of those things together. They run the fuel through the rocket engines on the shuttle itself, which are 99.9% .9 efficient. It's kind of impressive. They get up there into space, and they can lift all with all of that force, that little teeny shuttle with like seven or eight people in it. Chemicals are too heavy. We need to get fuel either when we're up there or we need to find a way to get up there without using as much fuel, and that's tough. But there are some plants. There are some ways that we can do that. A lot of times now when we get into space, we're using solar panels when we're up there because the sun is ever present and constantly shooting energy at us. So we can capture it and use it for electricity for satellites and things. We do that all the time. The Voyager missions used tiny nuclear reactors to generate electricity, and that will last for decades and decades, although it will run out eventually. But there are alternative propulsion methods, like ion propulsion, which are used right now for some probes and satellites, and it moves things around by shooting a beam of electrically charged particles out the back of the probe. It's generated by solar panels, so pretty renewable, easy to get, but the technology doesn't really move very much. It's like tiny amounts, and you have to leave it on for a long time to go fast, and then you have to turn it on the opposite direction to be able to slow down for the exact same amount of time. So if you leave it on for a week to get up to speed, you have to start slowing down a week in advance. It's really tough, still being researched, not particularly useful for, say, going to Jupiter. You'd want something a little stronger. Like maybe nuclear pulse propulsion or Project Orion, which was invented in the 50s or thought up. And that was the, it's, a, it's terrible. It's a terrible idea on so many levels. It's essentially that you blow up nuclear bombs out the back of the rocket. It's not a great idea. But uh, they were researching it until the 60s, thinking maybe it'll work. Then they came up with Project Daedalus, which is a fusion rocket. They would create microfusion, where atoms would fuse, creating energy that they could use out the back of the rocket again, propel them in a direction. Of course, we haven't actually figured out fusion yet, so it's a great idea, but we can't use it. And it would need a lot of fuel to go interstellar, like huge amounts of fuel, although it is Pretty promising, it's still decades off. On top of that, for the original product, Project Data List, which they came up with in like the late 50s, I think, early 60s, you'd actually have to go to Jupiter first and get some isotopes from Jupiter that would make it all work. So that's, that doesn't really go. There's also a spin-off, the Bassard Interstellar Ramjet, which would fly through space sucking up protons, because space may be a vacuum, but there's still stuff out there, and then you know somehow fuse those protons. I love space imagination, and it's, this was all NASA stuff. It's really, really cool. They collect fuel as they go. That's a great idea, and you know, that's not actually out of the realm of possibility. For example, there are currently things being worked on now, like solar sails. Now, it sounds exactly like what it is. The sun is constantly sending out solar wind, it's called, which is a bombardment of cosmic radiation and particles, and some of those particles have enough energy that if we use a solar sail or a large piece of specialized 
sort of fabric, we can capture that energy and use it to accelerate away from the sun. It's essentially a pirate ship in space, like I said. You're literally riding sunlight, which is amazing. But also problematic in that, again, it starts very slow. It's difficult to maintain. On top of that, the further away from the sun you get, the less solar wind you're going to experience. Though you could also put a laser on your spacecraft and shoot the laser at the, the sail and generate your own wind because that's cool. Although you'd need like a megawatt laser, which is, that's just too much. It's too much laser to get into space. There's also the magnetic sail, same thing, but with magnets. And the new James Webb Space Telescope might actually use solar sail technology, which is pretty exciting. We'll have to see. Some other ones that they're trying out that NASA's and other companies are looking into, um, you may have heard of the Impossible Drive or the M Drive, the EM Drive. It's a British invention. And it's called that because, well, it's supposed to be impossible, and it probably is. But this British company that invented it said that it can work even in a hard vacuum. Allegedly, the M drive creates thrust without propellant. It's a closed box, and they bounce microwaves inside of that box, and the thing moves. Yeah, I don't really get it either, but it's impossible drive, they say. There's also NASA is working on the warp drive, which, holy crap, Star Trek, yeah, but they say that it probably doesn't work yet. But that's the Eagle Lab. They're working on it at the Johnson Space Center in Texas. They say it might work. And essentially what will happen is it'll create a field around the ship and allow it to move through that field. But they are still decades away from that, too. Right now, pretty much what we got is chemical rockets, which I just badmouthed. Sorry. Uh, in the end, the best way to get around space is to not go the long way, you know, to not travel from here to there slowly laboriously using a sail or chemical rockets or fusion or even warp drives, but to find a way to slip through the fabric of space using a wormhole. It's complicated physics stuff. We don't even know if it's possible, though theoretically it is possible to essentially bend space. Think of a piece of paper and you're in one corner and you want to get to the other corner. The fastest way to get there is to put the corners next to each other. And that's what a wormhole does. Physics do allow for wormholes to happen. We've just never seen one, and we don't know how to create it, and it would create a lot of energy. Uh, it would need a lot of energy to be created. It's called an Einstein-Rosen bridge. So when in doubt, you know, just bend the universe, right? That's easy enough. Not really. <laughs> and if that blows your mind, it probably should. Because at one point, space travel in general was blowing our minds. I don't know if you got that from all five of these episodes that we've done on space travel, but space travel is crazy. It's crazy inspiring, it's dangerous, it's really amazing, and it needs a lot of imagination. There's currently the 100-year Starship project going on right now. It's scientists from all over the world coming together to try and figure out within a century how to get to the next star. This is happening now. They're figuring it out now because space travel is incredible. It's one of my favorite topics, and the reason is because it's amazing. I can't use those words enough. It's awesome. And in the real way that that word is supposed to be used, it's bringing awe to people. And it's always done that. And it probably always will do that. So why don't you tell us your favorite part about space travel? Go down into the comments. I'll be down there too. We can talk about it. Thank you for watching Test Tube Plus for this series. Make sure you check out all of the episodes. If you haven't, click here and you'll be able to see them. They are all super awesome. Make sure you subscribe for more Test Tube Plus. And if you were watching this episode and you would rather listen to this episode, like maybe during your commute or when you're at home just kind of tooling around, go over to iTunes, search for Test Tube Plus and subscribe there. We also have an audio podcast where we take all five episodes and we squish them together. It's pretty awesome. Thanks again for watching. I'm Trace. Come back next week. We're going to talk about psychedelic drugs. I know you're excited. It's going to be great. See you later. Thank <laughs> you.